Uh, we will finish with a, in an interview uh, of Moross's daughter, Susanna Moross Tarjan, by Andrew Grenade. Uh, I have a, um, I have a brief in with uh, Andrew Grenade. He is Associate Professor of Musicology and Chair of the Composition, Music Theory, and Musicology Division of the University of Missouri, Kansas City Conservatory of Music and Dance, and of course, Suzanne Moros Tarjan is the daughter of the composer we are celebrating today. Well, thank you for, ooh, it's very live. We appreciate you all coming. Um, I distinctly remember as a young undergraduate student, uh, my piano pedagogy professor being fascinated by film music and knowing I loved film music and saying, you must watch The Big Country and sitting me down to watch the film just being overwhelmed by the music. So this is a distinct honor uh, for me to be able to talk to you today. Uh, it, we've been hearing a lot about his music and a lot about his biography. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were going to pass back and forth, that's a pleasant surprise. Um, and we can hear a lot about that, but I'd be interested in hearing from your personal perspective, just thinking back what stands out for you the most about your father. Well, actually, it's been very interesting listening to the various uh, discussions this afternoon, because I'm not a, a musicologist, so hearing all this technical detail uh, I find quite fascinating. Um, my father was a very uh, shy person in public. He was very gregarious and friendly when he was with family and people he knew, but he did not have a very uh, gregarious public persona, which is part of the reason that he didn't want to be a conductor and he uh, didn't have a lot of public appearances. And um, he was a warm, friendly person, but as I said, shy. He was an extremely intellectual person. I mean, his mind was constantly going. He read voraciously on any subject you could imagine. He loved baseball. He, my husband's an engineer, and he used to discuss science with him and physics and whatever. So he really had a wide-ranging appetite for all the arts. Uh, and of course, seemed to be always composing, even if he wasn't always at the piano. Uh, one of the things Andrew asked me about was uh, how he worked. When he was in Hollywood, he worked in a studio. Uh, but when he wasn't, when he was writing anything else, he worked at home, at the piano, with the cigarette, always in the ashtray, and uh, uh, with his tongue in his cheek, he, he read a lot. You could always tell when he was composing because he'd be reading and his tongue would be in his cheek and you just knew that, you know, that was going on. Uh, my mother and I'm an only child and my mother and I were really part of everything. Whenever he would write a new theme about something, he would call my mother in and uh, want her to listen to it, even though she wasn't a musician, but she was his right-hand person, so to speak. Uh, so, well, well, what, what, what we're asking me. Well, I was just wondering if, here he's at the piano and he's playing and, and you're hearing all this, what's the first piece of music of his that you remember, that you consciously remember? My father's a composer and he wrote that. Uh, you know, I, I thought about that question since you gave me a heads up on it. Um, I don't really know, you know, when I, uh, I always was hearing music. Uh, we did not listen. He didn't listen to a lot of recordings or any recordings because he felt it would interfere for him with what he was doing in, in composition. He was always playing. I got used to uh, hearing things over and over and over again. Uh, we've had pianists visiting us and practicing and it drives my husband crazy when they repeat the same thing over and over again but it doesn't bother me because I grew up with that. Um, I, I can't really say which was the first piece I heard. I certainly uh, think of the golden apple and uh, being uh, around when they were writing the golden apple. Do you have a certain piece, because I mean, we've, we've heard today about all the different genres that he was working in. Is there a certain piece of yours that uh, for you will always kind of stand out as a piece that represents your father for you in your mind? 
Um, again, you gave me a heads up on I that know. question, so I had a chance to think about it. One time, uh, somebody asked me if my father ever wrote any dark music. And I was rather startled by that question, but when I thought about it, I realized he didn't. Uh, he, uh, all the, the joyousness, the energy, the vitality of his music, particularly in their early years, uh, is what really uh, I think of when I think of his music. The symphony, I mean, the, if you listen to the whole symphony, the, the joy of it. Uh, he was a young man, he uh, was very happily married, he, he and my mother had a very close relationship. He, just had, had a baby, uh, and you know, it was a happy time in his life, and the symphony reflects that. Uh, the Golden Apple, all, all his music reflects a real vitality and a real energy uh, and a real uh, love of America. He had a real love affair with America when he was a young man in, in 1937. He took a bus from Chicago to California and Mariana has written about that. Uh, and it was transformational for him. He got off in Albuquerque. He had never been out west before. He'd never seen the plains, the mountains, the west. And he fell in love with it. And that uh, was reflected throughout his music uh, in later years. He, he uh, wrote to the musicologist Christopher Palmer one time, many years later, that uh, when he went when he uh, wrote the theme for the big country, uh, he thought about that initial trip out west and it came to him almost automatically. So he had a real sense of joy of, of life. He had a lot of frustrations. His music wasn't accepted the way he would have liked it to be. Uh, but he really had a, a joie de vivre. Well, you talk about the first symphony and we heard from Charles this wonderful um, discussion of it. And I understand there's scraps of a second symphony. Did he ever talk about composing the second symphony or? Uh, he talked about a second symphony. He never finished it. Later on he also talked he was going to write a, a vocal symphony about Amerigo mm -hmm. Vespucci. He, he didn't do that. He didn't finish that one either. So no, there are some uh, scraps bits in, in the collection at Columbia University Library. Okay. but. That's it. Okay. Well, we've heard a lot about today also his collaborations with John Latouche and then also with all his film collaborations. I wonder if you'd talk to, to us a little bit about um, your father as a collaborator, um, what you experienced, what you saw, the way in which he worked with other people, why he seemed drawn to uh, composing and collaboration. Well, he loved the theater, he loved drama, and uh, he liked uh, writing for the theater, he loved writing ballets. So when you, when you do that kind of work, you clearly have a collaborator. Um, John Latouche and following his death, Edward Eager, with whom he wrote uh, Gentlemen Be Seated, were his two major collaborators. They both passed away, Edward um, after Latouche. And he really never was able to find another collaborator after that. He spoke to different people, he, he tried to work with different people, but he could just never seem to find anybody. And uh, I remember a comment once, I, I think I read it in an interview, where he said he just wished that the lyric writers would, you know, put the lyrics under the door <laughs> and go away. <laughs> uh, he, never, he never wrote his own lyrics, uh, so he, he he always worked with lyric writers and, and uh, other people. The only thing later in life he did in the 70s was write a one-act opera based on Lucille Fletcher's Sorry, Wrong Number. Mm. And that's the only time he ever set a piece of music to text. Other than that, everything was written based on other people's lyrics. Did but you? He, uh, just, uh, let me oh, just please. say though, he didn't write the lyrics, but they would give him the lyrics, and you know he worked on them. <laughs> but he didn't start out with his own set of lyrics. Mm -hmm. Did you um, thinking about Latouche? Did you, are you have any stories that your father related later on about uh, his collaboration and working with Latouche, either on ballet ballads oh, or dear. Golden Apple? Well, uh, Latouche was a fascinating man. I was fourteen. 16 when he died, 14 when they 
uh, Golden Apple was produced. So throughout my young years, Touche was at various times part of our lives. And I have to say, I absolutely adored him. He was a nutty, crazy guy, funny, brilliant, uh, very difficult to work with. I have a series of letters between he and my father that are <laughs> really very funny, uh, but also uh, express my father's great exasperation that he you know, didn't get the lyrics he pro was promised and this sort of thing. But uh, my, my memories of Touche, I, I, I really just loved him. I, I was crazy about him. And uh, actually, he was crazy about me, too, because in some of his letters, he makes references to uh, the blue, uh, burgeoning juvenile delinquent or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so. well, what about film scoring? How, I know that he had an early friendship with Bernard Herrmann uh, when they were very young. How did, how did your father then move into film scoring? What was kind of the impetus to get him into that area? Well, in the 30s, everybody was going to Hollywood. I mean, Arnold Schoenberg went to Hollywood trying to get film scoring jobs. Everybody was out there because there was no, you know, it was the Depression, there was no work in New York. Um, my father went to Los Angeles the first time in 1937, and then he went back to New York and back to Los Angeles, but um, he just wasn't able to get film scoring jobs, even though he would have liked to. Uh, he got jobs orchestrating. His first orchestration job was uh, offered to him through Aaron Copeland, who asked him to orchestrate Our Town. After that, he did several years of orchestration, eight years actually, before he was able to get his first film score job. So it wasn't because he didn't he wanted to. Everybody uh, either went to Hollywood and stayed there. Uh, people like David Raxson, uh, Alex North, I mean, they were all from New York in the early 30s, and then they went out to Los Angeles, and they stayed there and made their career in the movies. My father enjoyed writing movies, but it wasn't what he wanted to do for his entire career, so he went back and forth. Truthfully, um, you know, that it's where he went uh, to, to make money when he couldn't, make, you know, make money writing shows or symphonies or whatever. Uh, that's the reality. One of the things that struck me, I don't know if uh, anyone else knows this, but if you look at the listing that they have that Charles provided for us, there's this um, huge listing of the orchestration jobs and then moving into the film scoring jobs. I wonder if, if you have a sense of, uh, did he view orchestration differently than composition? Were they, for him, two separate uh, endeavors, or was it one would inform the other? Uh, how did he approach his orchestration? I guess is kind of the core of the question. Well, uh, some of the answer to that question comes from interviews that he that I have that he gave. Um, he found in working with, uh, first of all, he studied orchestration at Juilliard, and then he said that when he orchestrated in Hollywood. Uh, he felt it was fantastic training because uh, he could orchestrate something in the morning and hear it in the afternoon so that he could hear his mistakes, hear, you know, learn from, learn from that. So he learned a tremendous amount uh, from working as an orchestrator. Uh, but uh, what was, let, let's, what, how, let's yeah. go, go back a minute. What, where did you want me to go with that? Well, just uh, the way that he approached orchestration, if he approached it differently than he did um, the own, his own pieces. And I was also, also he thinking of the Little his Mermaid. Own pieces. He was not happy when he didn't have time and had to delegate orchestration. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were times when he did, but he would give very specific, uh, you know, instructions of how he wanted things to be. Yeah. So. I, I mean, an orchestration was sort of an outgrowth of the piece. Mm -hmm. What? A, no, please. I'm sorry, I was just thinking that we're running out of time. Okay. That'd be wonderful. Okay. Yeah. No, no. So please, we have a microphone here. If you please come up to the microphone, because we are recording, we like to get uh, your questions, but also so everyone can hear, because this room, as you can tell, is very large. So if you have questions, please come up. And these are questions that can either be for Susanna or questions for um, anyone. Just Susanna? All right. Just questions for Susanna. Uh, please come up and um, 
talk into the microphone if you have questions. Or you just listen to us keep yammering on, but we'd love to hear what you have to say. Hi, my uh, name is Mather Feifenberger from Washington, D.C. Um, I'm just going to relate a story about the first time I became aware of your father's music and see if you have anything to add to it. Um, um, I think the, I mean, one of the most recent times in modern times that his music was sort of brought out again was, as, at least as I recall, uh, the 1991 film Billy Crystal City Slickers about the, you know, the guys going out west and <laughs> roping cattle and stuff. Not in, the, not in the film itself, but in the commercials for that, they use some of Big Country. Right, right. <laughs> I, I'm just curious if you can elaborate on that a bit, how that came about. Do you, know, do you have any more information? In those kinds of things, I, I have nothing to do with it. That, you know, that music is uh, licensed from the publisher. Mm -hmm. I was very happy when I heard that. It, it, it worked well. <laughs> So sort of setting up the film because the, just the satirical contrast between your father's wonderful music and these silly things that these guys were doing trying to be cowboys. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Alex from Cincinnati. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your, your father's taste for Broadway musicals and composers who came before him, um, you know, composers from the 30s and 40s and 50s, and if he had a favorite, favorite musical um, since he really loved the theater. Um, I, I don't know if I can think of a favorite musical, but certainly his favorite composers were people like Jerome Kern. He used to talk about uh, how, what a beautiful song, All the Things You Are is. Uh, um, the early composers, early popular music he loved. The music, you know, that whole, that whole period. Jerome Kern comes to mind there, are others. He was a big fan of uh, somebody, I guess Charles mentioned Gottschalk and, but he, he loved popular music of the period and he uh, followed it. Any more questions? Yeah. Here's one. I'm not sure you can answer. I'm Roger Hall from uh, uh, Sammy Awards. Um, there's a song in The Cardinal that has lyrics, and I was wondering if you know who wrote the lyrics. Carolyn Lee. Carolyn Lee, okay. Did your father uh, choose her, or was it something that came from the studio? Um, she was a friend, well, it came from the studio. And because she was a friend of Frank Sinatra's, he recorded it. It's a beautiful rendition. It, it is. It's a beautiful song. It is, yes. As a matter of fact, I've recently um, learned about religious songs being very big today in popular music. So I brought the song just about last week to the attention of the publisher saying, you know, here's this really beautiful song that's sitting around uh, in your vaults. So. Yes. Okay. It, it is. Uh, it is on YouTube, the Frank Sinatra version. Could I also ask, did your father uh, do any songs separate from films, or was it something he was not involved with? He wasn't involved with them. Just strictly The song from the big country we were talking about it earlier is <laughs> terrible. <laughs> he had nothing to do with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. But I think he was very pleased with the Carolyn Lee lyric for that. Yes. Okay, thank you. We out of time? I think so. Yeah, I, I think we... Thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the people who gave papers, and thanks to all the people who came here to celebrate Jerry Mohawks. Uh, it's music that we all love, and let's... I hope we hear it. So it, you realize hearing these talks, how much there is we could hear if they would perform it, <laughs> and how worthy it is to be performed. Thank you all.